Hi, good evening. Can you hear me? No? Yeah. Hi. Now you can. My name is Jonathan Beach. I'm the president of Occidental College. Uh, and as you may know, Occidental is one of a handful of liberal arts colleges located in the heart of a major metropolitan area. And we take our uh, location very seriously uh, and really wanted this series of uh, conversations uh, about Los Angeles. We want to be part of the conversation about uh, the future of Los Angeles. And we thought, who better to orchestrate, curate, and lead that discussion than Christopher Hawthorne. Christopher is a professor at Occidental College, and uh, many of you know him as the architectural critic for the Los Angeles Times. Um, this series has been really quite extraordinary, and I want to thank Christopher uh, for leading and I also want to thank Brett Schrader and Lisa Suarez for all their efforts in uh, putting this on. Um, and I want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, this is the second to last in this series. Uh, the final uh, conversation will be at Clock Shop and it will concern the Los Angeles River. Uh, and we hope uh, those of you who uh, can come will come. So uh, welcome everyone and I turn it over to Christopher Hawthorne. Thank you. Thank you, President Veach. Um, it's really, really terrific to be here. As, as he mentioned, this is the fifth of six events. Two weeks from tonight, we'll be talking about the LA River. Um, and we really wanted, um, from the beginning of the series, to, to think about ways to get out into the city. And when we decided that we would have a conversation on the single family house, uh, we thought for a, a number of reasons that we will explain over the course of the evening that this would be the perfect setting uh, because it's kind of a foundational uh, piece of residential modernism in Los Angeles, uh, but also, as we'll discuss, um, uh, a little bit more than just a single-family house, a house that was really designed to be shared. And as we move into this era that we're describing as the third Los Angeles, when really we have to be confronting ideas about living in denser ways and collective shared residential space, um, I think a lot of the architectural lessons of, of this great house are... are relevant today. Um, so let me echo President Veach's um, uh, thanks to Brett Schrader and Lisa Suarez, who, as these events get further from Oxy and more complicated, um, she, she um, uh, Lisa gets more and more adept at really dealing with everything that we're throwing at her. And she and Brett have really made all of this um, uh, run so smoothly. And I really want to echo those thanks. And, and also Kimberly Meyer and Max Center for being our hosts um, tonight. So in all of the events, um, we have really tried to be creative about the format and not just have a panel discussion with, with four or five people talking for 90 minutes and, and saying things that they've said before. So we're going to continue with our effort to be a little creative about the format. Let me give you a sense of what we'll do um, this evening. I will talk very briefly, kind of lay the groundwork for the conversation, and then Kimberly Meyer, the director of MAC, and, and I will sit down and, and talk about the history of this house a little bit. Um, and about uh, uh, Schindler's years in Los Angeles. Um, then we'll have uh, some uh, student readings, uh, a piece by Esther McCoy, and uh, some dialogue between uh, Barbara Eisenberg and Frank Gehry talking about his house from Barbara Eisenberg's book of Conversations with Frank. Um, and then we'll hear some kind of interlude short presentations from the architect Peter Zellner, um, and DJ Waldy, the writer, talking about the LA, ha the LA House in one way or another. And then finally, I'll sit down with uh, four panelists, Mr. Waldy, Mott Smith, Barbara Bester, and Mar uh, Maria Cabildo for a discussion about the single family house and new ways to think about it potentially in this third uh, Los Angeles. We'll try, to f we'll try to wrap up just a little bit after nine, and we do actually have to pay attention to the clock because we are in a... In a um, if not a single family neighborhood, a residential neighborhood, and we want to be um, mindful of that and try to get wrapped up and out of here uh, before 10 o'clock um, with all these chairs folded up. Um, so the, um, in, in all the events, I've also done a quick survey of the crowd, and I want, I want to do that um, again this evening. Um, how many of you are attending your first Third LA event? Okay, pretty good. Pretty good. Um, a uh, pretty good group of you. Any, anybody besides my students who have been to all five so far? Okay, a couple. Thank you. So, it's so great. Um, uh, how many of you in this group had never been to the Schindler House before? Anyone? Actually, a fair number of you. Wow. Um, 
anybody uh, come from, let's say, west of the 405? And uh, Oxy students and Oxy community, raise your hands. Where are you guys? All right, terrific. So quickly, I just wanted to. Um, I wanted to show, thank you, a, a few images to um, sort of set the stage for the, the larger conversation um, uh, this evening. Um, deeply ingrained in the Angelino psyche is this idea that we live in a city of houses. This is Lakewood, about which DJ Waldy will have more to say later. And in LA, um, the architecture of <clears throat> the single-family house has been tightly bound up with visions of the future, with, uh, with experimentation, with innovation. This is Ralph Rapson's 1945 contribution to the case study uh, program complete with, um, do I have a pointer on this? I think so. Okay, complete with husband, uh, commuting to work in his helicopter and wife um, uh, waving to him while hanging the laundry out to dry. Although, as Esther McCoy, who will also make an appearance later on, as I mentioned, pointed out, in seeming to predict that the helicopter would become more affordable than the washer and dryer, quote, Rapson's money was on the wrong machine. Still, this notion of the single family house as a locus of experimentation and progress in Los Angeles architecture persisted, of course, long past the end of the case study program in the middle 1960s. Can everyone hear in the back, by the way? I meant to ask all of you. You guys can hear? Good. Um, this, of course, is the pink bungalow in Santa Monica that Frank Gehry bought, tore open, and wrapped in chain link and corrugated metal in the 1970s. And we'll hear Gary's own words on the house later on. So I wanted you to have those of you who don't know the house, and that's probably very few of you, to have a kind of mental image of it um, for later on. Certainly, if you look at any zoning uh, map of the city of Los Angeles, this idea that this is a city of houses seems as valid as ever. The image on the right, um, the yellow portions are the single family or R1 zones. Um, so something like 80 to 85% of the residential land in the city is still zoned for the single family house. Um, and, that, and that's also something that will continue to come up uh, in this discussion. But there is another history, a city before the city of houses. The first Los Angeles, as we've been calling it, to distinguish it from the second LA of the post-war years and our emerging third Los Angeles of the present day. And during the first LA, it's no exaggeration to say that Los Angeles produced many of the most groundbreaking experiments in modernist multifamily housing anywhere in the world by architects including Gregory Ain, Richard Neutra, and here Irving Gill with the Horatio West Court Apartments, which predate the Schindler House just by a couple of years. They're from 1919 in Santa Monica. Um, and there were, of course, uh, remarkable examples of bungalow courts in Pasadena from the same vintage, like the Haskell Courts. This is from 1923 near Caltech, which are now highly sought after subsidized housing. And Schindler himself was designing a number of innovative multifamily projects in the pre-war years, like the Mackey Apartments, now operated by the Mack Center, of course. And Schindler's own house, our venue this evening, and as Kimberly and I will discuss in a little bit, this was a house designed to be shared. Schindler himself called it a cooperative dwelling for two young couples, and the floor plan shows um, the studio around a shared kitchen, and the bedrooms really uh, up um, sleeping porches um, uh, upstairs. And so the city has a long, rich history of experimental thinking about shared and collective housing that I think is too often overlooked. These days, meanwhile, the city is no longer one that produces single-family houses except in very negligible quantities. Nine of 10 residential units constructed in LA County uh, these days are in apartment or condo buildings, and th that figure is surely higher in the city of Los Angeles. And at the same time, we've made it much tougher to build housing of any kind. This is a graph that's been making the rounds in architectural circles in recent days. The black line is uh, the population that the city is zoned to accommodate. 
the red line, the actual population of the city. So in 1960, we had a population of 2.5 million, and we were zoned for a city of 10 million people. Um, and over time, as the population has grown, um, the, the zoning uh, envelope, as it were, has tightened really dramatically. And as Henry Graybar put it in a piece uh, on Salon that some of you may have seen this week, Los Angeles has created a crisis of artificial scarcity, in his words, a burden for renters, a drain on economic growth, and an environmental disaster. The city has planned itself into a cage. Uh, all of this comes as, as Mayor Garcetti has called for building 100,000 new units of housing between now and 2021, which would require essentially doubling the pace at which we have been building housing um, over the last 20 years, 25 years. And even 100,000 units is, is not nearly enough if what we're talking about is beginning to put a dent in the affordability question and beginning to bring prices down, uh, be beginning to broaden access to housing um, for middle class, working class families. Still, as Dana Cuff of City Lab at UCLA, who was a guest on the very first Third LA uh, program in February, points out, there are roughly 500,000 single-family houses in the city of LA, there are probably 550,000, something like that. Um, and if one in five of those were able to add uh, an accessory dwelling unit, a granny flat, which is something we'll also talk about tonight, um, that would hit that 100,000 mark right there. Um, there Oh, there's also a sense that of, an, of a kind of increasing divide, I think, between the city's single-family neighborhoods doing whatever they can, and for many legitimate reasons, which we'll also talk about, to protect that low-density fabric and the denser multifamily core of the city. Um, and that multifamily core, which you can see here, um, it, this is another one of those images that's been getting a lot of attention among architects and planners lately, and it shows the kind of dense uh, multifamily core, and we're, we're right on the edge of it here in West Hollywood, basically stretching from downtown west uh, to West Hollywood, um, is essentially just as dense as San Francisco, about 17, uh, between 17 and 18,000 residents um, uh, per square mile. Um, and so if we go back to this image of the, of the single family zone, that, that sort of dense uh, that sort of dense core would be right uh, sort of here um, uh, where you can see a lack of, of yellow. Um, uh, and and th there is this kind of dense, you know, transit uh, rich and relatively dense core of the city that's actually quite urban even by um, the standards of traditional cities in New York. The, the politics uh, of growth are nothing if not confusing and, and really contradictory here. However, this Sunday New York Times piece on the drought in California, which I'm sure many of you saw, suggested that the chief enemy of water conservation is growth, particularly of the residential variety, and the really remarkable photographs that accompanied by Damon Winter uh, really made clear that that was the core of the, of the argument um, that the piece was making. In fact, though, total water use in Los Angeles, and that's not per capita, that's total water use, has gone down, actually, since 1980, as the piece itself acknowledged. Why? Because the city has grown denser, um, especially in that midsection that we were just uh, talking about here, because it's accommodating its growth uh, increasingly in apartments and condos and not in houses. And that suggests, I think, a kind of fundamental flaw in this argument that growth is making the drought worse. In fact, and this is where the contradictions begin to come in. The new or, or uh, newly energized slow growth movement in Los Angeles um, is, is hardly good news for water conservation or sustainability more broadly because what that slow growth movement is defending is largely the detached house with, with lawn. Um, so that brings us back in some ways full circle to the question of uh, the questions that we want to explore this evening, what do the single family house and the single family neighborhood mean now in this third Los Angeles? Is there a way to see them? And I think these are the crucial questions for this evening as the proving ground for new kinds of architectural innovation uh, without giving up the kind of connection to landscape um, that is so important and the kind of re uh, residential fabric that, that is, continues to be so appealing for so many of us here. Um, can we reinvent them? Can we tweak them to produce some new housing models to address the issues of affordability, 
of sustainability, of flexibility, really, in, in what has become quite a rigid housing stock in many ways? Or will we rather squeeze in, continue to squeeze in density everywhere else and simply preserve many of those single-family houses in, in amber? Um, and, and finally, can we begin to make some, some finer distinctions um, in what we sometimes lump together as development, as a kind of single um, anxiety-producing force? In other words, can we talk about mansionization in one way, the small lot subdivision ordinance in another, um, the accessory dwelling unit, the granny flat, in, in yet a third way, and begin to make some nuanced and intelligent distinctions among those categories. So before we get to those specific questions, I thought it was important to spend a little time talking about the particular house, and this particular house, the Schindler House, and how it's linked to the first LA's experiments in collective and shared in multifamily housing um, that is at least a little bit denser than the single family house um, that I mentioned. So helping me to do that is Kimberly Meyer. I'd like to invite her to come up and strange to invite her to come and introduce her at her own house as it were, but thank you, Kimberly. So why don't we begin, if you want to tell us a little bit about um, how it is that the Mac Center came to operate and, and oversee the, the Schindler House, then we'll talk a little bit about the house itself. Okay, so yeah, we'll start from, the, from now. Essentially, Schindler was from Vienna. He, he trained there, he was born there, trained there as an architect, and um, it was one of his mentors, Adolf Loos, that, that sort of urged him to go to America because Loos said, that's where modernism is really gonna happen, it's not happening in Europe. Um, and so Schindler made his way here through Frank Lloyd Wright, he actually wound up in Los Angeles because he was um, overseeing the Barnstell House, uh, also known as the Hollyhock House, over on Olive Hill. Um, and so, because of that connection, uh, in the mid '90s, the the director of the of the of the Mach, the Museum for Applied Arts uh, and Contemporary Art, decided that it would make a nice link. Um, to link Vienna with Los Angeles um, by making a small satellite of that museum here. And so the Mac Center for Art and Architecture at the Schindler House was founded uh, in the mid-90s. And it was not only because Schindler was Viennese, that, that was certainly part of it, and it wasn't only because uh, the Austrians love to come to Los Angeles, which they do, and this gives them a good excuse, um, but it's also, it's also kind of apt for this particular house because it was never meant to be a house uh, to house the sort of typical, very insular nuclear family. Um, not only was it a shared family house, like, like Christopher mentioned, but it, it was actually always meant to be um, open for guests and visitors um, and open for people of all walks of life um, to come and share ideas and to share artistic practices, to share, um, you know, ways of new ways of living and new ways of thinking and so that's I think one of the really crucial parts of the way this house was really thought about was as, as, a, as a center um, for a sort of avant-garde activity and so when the Mac Center was founded in the mid 90s that was very much the cue that we took um, it's not only is the house itself um, an experiment completely it was sort of Schindler's way of, of trying to figure out some of his ideas that he'd written about in manifestos in his early years so architecturally it was an experiment, but socially it was also an experiment. And I think that that's actually what makes, what gives us a lot of our um, sort of impetus to do what we do here. So for the last 20 years we've been essentially doing programming that, you know, is both art and architecture and all the disciplines that kind of like overlap with these. Um, and the through line is experimentation. We kind of take Schindler's cue on that one and, um, and decide, and, and we do lots of things, and some of them work, and some of them don't, like any good experiments. And uh, but that's that's kind of what why we're here. And the block itself really was a center for intellectual activity. That I, I showed Irvin Gill project. That uh, Irvin Gill's great Dodge House was up the street, um, um, now sadly demolished. And I think it's important to mention that because the uh, I think one of the reasons for the anxiety about development in residential single-family neighborhoods is that we have this um, this terrible history of neglecting. Um, those important landmarks in the Dodge House is probably the one, um, uh, not not quite our Penn Station, it didn't quite galvanize preservation in the way that that did in New York, but the way that Esther McCoy 
wrote about that house before and after it was demolished in many ways was similar to what Ada Louise Huxtable was doing and writing about Penn Station before and, before and after. Um, but the whole block um, was really a center of kind of an intellectual culture mm -hmm. right around the time that they built the house, but, but also for the, the rest of the 20s and 30s. Right. Yeah, very much so. Um, and so that gives us a great s place to start. So for example, if you've wandered into the house before this talk, you may have seen um, some of the parch instruments that we've got on display. Um, those are set up for um, an opera. We're hosting Opera Povera, which is a, a very experimental opera company um, over the weekend, Friday and Saturday. So if you haven't got a ticket for that and you're interested, do come back because it's actually kind of amazing. And these instruments, for example, um, were, were, are built out of a very experimental way of thinking about the scale and about music and everything's composed um, in a very experimental way. So this is kind of, we get to do this because the history actually mandates that. And, and tell us a little bit more about the ways in which that shared space worked bo both when the house was new and later when Richard Neutra and, and his wife moved in. How was that sort of negotiated both architecturally and, and socially during the, the early life of the house? Well, it, yeah, the house is interesting because it's, it's been described as a pinwheel floor plan and it really has sort of three major wings. One wing was for the original family, the Chases, uh, that went in to partnership with the Schindlers on, on this whole project. The other s half was for the Schindlers and then the third wing was a guest apartment. So there was always, the, from the very beginning, this idea that there would be transients essentially living in the house as well. Um, the kitchen was shared because the idea was that if you uh, were able to kind of trade off on the household chores, on the kitchen chores, then you would have more time to do your work. If you actually look at the original floor plan, each of the four main rooms are actually st studios named after their occupants. They were meant to be a place for each one of those creative adults to do their work. And then they would come together and have family life um, or social life uh, in, in, out in the patio. So we're not in one of them right now, but each, on, on each wing there's a kind of more intimate and kind of enclosed uh, outdoor space. And that was considered a room. It had a fireplace. It's where you lived. And then, as Christopher also mentioned, when you sleep at night, you sleep up in the sleeping baskets. And this was the 20s, so it was felt at that time that it was really healthy to live outside. And of course, they were from Austria, and they felt like it's wonderfully warm here. So they, so they would sleep outside in these kind of um, hammocks um, up in these sleeping baskets. And so the whole idea was kind of to be in some ways as close to the land and as close to the as sort of like nature within the city as possible. Uh, live in a sort of very primitive uh, way, but very elegant way, and, and, and live in a way that is, is inclusive uh, for all the kinds of you know, people that might want to come in. So there was provision made for sort of solitary artistic work and provision made for um, sort of an open-doored attitude about uh, sort of artistic and political work. And Schindler was very explicit about wanting it to be like camping, a kind of temporary experience. The canvas um, was, was, was part of that. He had been inspired right by a trip to Yosemite before he began designing the house and, and, and really wanted to figure out, um, test out some ideas about the kind of construction that wouldn't have been possible right in Europe, given the climate, given what could be built here and, and right. how one could live. Right, exactly, yeah. And he, um, so the Chases moved out after about two years. They, they went to Florida to, to kind of like take up the family business there. And that's when the Neutras moved in. Um, and Neutra and Schindler had been friends um, in Vienna. And Schindler was the older, um, kind of more of a mentor almost of, of Neutra. And so Neutra wa desperately wanted to get out of Europe because there was a war and it was pretty horrible to be there. And so Schindler was really the one who was quite instrumental in getting, finally getting Neutra here. When he got here, the, um, they had somebody else living in this side of the house temporarily. So the Neutras actually lived in the guest apartment and then moved into the Chase uh, apartment as soon as um, those people left. And so that, that was the period where they, there was about four years where Schindler and, and, and Neutra collaborated. And um, yeah, it was a very interesting time, very fertile time, I think, for both architects. It's when they both did um, the, the, the level buildings, which were very formative for each of them, the level beach house for Schindler, the level health house for, for Neutra. Um, and then they had kind of um, a, a major split, a major fallout that didn't get resolved till they were, uh, till Schindler was essentially on his deathbed and they were stuck in the same hospital room. They wound room. up in the same yeah. hospital <laughs> totally room, right? Randomly. It's one of those stories that yeah. in the inevitable biopic that I'm still, we're all waiting <laughs> for waiting. the Schindler <laughs> and Neutra. Um, it's a scene that no one will believe that they had a kind of rapprochement uh, late in life in this uh, hotel, in this hospital room that they coincidentally happened to, to share. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite a saga. Yeah. Um, so given your experience in this house and how much you've thought about it, I was very interested to, to, to talk with you over the last few days about 
your own thoughts in your own neighborhood in Northeast LA about beginning to talk with some friends and neighbors about some potential new collective um, uh, housing possibilities and how that could begin to chip away at what has become um, such a problem of affordability in such a sense that, that prices are going up and people are being sort of, um, if not displaced, forced out of um, a certain kind of idea about residential life in Los Angeles. So can you tell us a little bit uh, about that and maybe how it relates back to, to what you know about the history of this house too? Yeah, I mean, I, I have a very strong affinity with this house architecturally and socially. It's definitely politically, I'm kind of right here with this idea of, of communal housing. And so it's interesting, like, yeah, I, I live in Lincoln Heights and, and I've just recently joined We've been formed, we formed a study group with some other people who are from that part of town to sort of start to look into what it would take to put together some kind of a cooperative housing situation. And initially came out of people who were in a babysitting co-op together, which has nothing to do with me because I don't have kids, but it kind of came out of this sense of like, we all have needs and, we all, and this idea of always having to, to find them privately doesn't make a lot of sense, and um, and 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 I came at it very much from this idea that it's it seems to be such a shame to, to that we've gotten into this point where we only think about housing in terms of speculation, or if you're buying a house and you're part of them, it's like the way for the middle class to like gain wealth, which is true. But this idea that like that's what a home has become is something that you just invest in and hope that then when you want to sell it, you'll have your nest egg like all ready for you. That it should that there's more to it than that. And this idea of cooperative housing kind of carving out a space in the city that keeps it insulated from this kind of speculation and, and sort of like drives the priority someplace else, thinking about land and home. I think that's something which, um, that which is, it's really appealing to me, and and so we're starting to kind of explore. We've done some field trips. We went over to Echo Village, and it's interesting to start to look at these places, and I think it takes an incredible sort of sense of generosity. Like in the end, I don't know if any of us will do it because we all do have our little houses and we do you know, secretly hope that our, our neighborhood's property values go up because we are depending on that for our retirement. But, but yet I think it's like t a place like Echo Village which has actually said, no, we're gonna do this and we're not gonna displace people and we're gonna keep this as a, as a place where you know, speculation doesn't happen. It's not about that. I think it's um, so inspiring. And so do you have a sense at this point of what the obstacles would be, policy or, or otherwise, to actually make it happen? I mean, whenever I show that Horatio West Court project, I have to caution and say the reason we can't build that now is just parking requirements more than anything. <laughs> and I think we'll talk about that um, a little bit later. But um, do you have a sense that it's possible? And are there major kind of policy obstacles you'd have to get over or wait, wait until they're, they're changed to make that kind of new version of collective housing uh, really possible? I mean, interestingly enough, it's something that Garcetti is really interested in, and um, there have, there, there starts to be, you know, actually policies starting to be put into place that's going to make it a lot easier to do that. Um, and even to the extent that there are a lot of places, like for example, um, Caltrans has, you know, has just held on to like wide swaths of, of properties where they think they might want to put the 710 freeway and then they, and, and they won't or something like that. So there are these places that eventually are kind of all together and that could be sort of, um, you know, procured in a way, and, the, and because there are people in the city right now who are interested in this idea, there might even be funding potentially to help do this. So actually, I think the wind is a little bit blowing in our favor at the moment. Um, everything so far, again, we just formed this group like six months ago, so it's just been a research process, but it kind of looks good, and I think if, m on a personal level, I think the people involved, the, the more difficult thing is, um, you know, finding that peer group that you actually <laughs> really want to do it with because it sounds good, but then in the end it's like, do I really want to, you know, do I really want to be with that person or that person or how much do I even have to be with them? I think that part of it, in the end we are these kind of, um, you know, we are these kind of individualists. And so I think, you know, to come back to the Schindler House, this idea of how do you find a way to, have the space that you need and the privacy that you've come to sort of, you know, demand, and at the same time find a space that um, can be shared and that, that really makes sense for, for a certain kind of peer group. It's super interesting you mentioned this 710 because I'm, I'm working on a series for the LA Times for later this year on, on the freeways and sort of reimagining the freeway and that 710 space now that Caltrans is, and Metro's finally, it seems, giving up on the idea of a, of a surface route for the 710. There is a huge piece of land there, and I think some combination of 
new models of affordable housing, protect, perhaps collective and, and open space, is really the most appealing thing to try to promote there. So I think there, there's potential, particularly connected to uh, ways that we're thinking about transportation and mobility differently, and even Metro is beginning to take on the charge of building affordable housing, which is a big shift for them. So there are a lot of things afoot that I think um, begin to open up the possibility of new ways of thinking about some of these problems and maybe looking back to these lessons of the, the pre-war year. So please join me in thanking Kimberly for that quick <laughs> introduction to the house and its connection to the rest of the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you. And for all you haven't been here before and you didn't get in, come back. <laughs> so I'm going to bring up um, a couple of my students um, uh, to, to do a couple of readings, and I'll, I'll introduce them, uh, both of the readings together, um, and they will follow uh, one on the other. First, um, uh, Grace Hancock will read a 1951 piece by Esther McCoy, first published in the LA Times, as a matter of fact, which is called, If You Don't Want to Get a Loan, emphasis on don't, and two other students, um, Brianna Sinsun and Samantha Delgadillo will read excerpts from a conversation, as I mentioned, between Barbara Eisenberg and Frank Gehry about Frank's own house. So uh, Grace Hancock, take it away. If you don't want to get a loan. We lent on anything that isn't a freak, the man at FHA told the Eagers, who had gone to inquire about loans. As the Eagers were avid readers of home magazines, they knew what was not a freak. A house had been planning in their minds for five years. It turned its back to the street and faced a garden, as the magazine writers phrased it. Naturally, there would be some floor-to-ceiling glass on the garden side. For the sake of economy, and to make possible several luxuries, the roof would be on one plane, a shed roof rather than one with valleys and peaks. FHA had no objection to modern design, but when the Eagers described their view lot to the FHA man, he shook his head. He advised a typical lot. But Hillside lot is typical in our neighborhood, Eager said. Eager stopped by his bank the next morning and talked with someone in the loan department. In the long run, Eager, said the banker, you'll find that it pays to get a flat lot. It stands to reason no one is going to lend as much on a Hillside property. This was a disappointment for Eager and something of a surprise. Half of Los Angeles, it seemed to him, was Hillside, and yet no one liked to lend on it. Reluctantly, the Eagers gave up their view lot and bought a flat one. It came as a decided shock to the Eagers when FHA turned down the plans for a loan. The architect was in the East receiving his award when this occurred, and Eager decided to go in and talk to FHA. He was shown into Mr. Wary's office. I wanted to find out what was the matter with my house, Eager said. Nothing's the matter, it's just too individualistic, Wary said. There are some other deficiencies in it also. Could you be more specific, Eager asked. Wary unrolled the plans and anchored them to his desk. Which is the front, he asked. This is the front, Eager said. The garden side is the front. Well, what's this? The street side. That's the only elevation that interests us. Now you have your kitchen on the front and your living room on the back. Wary's eyes pounced on something in the plan. Tell me, he asked quietly. What is your objection to plaster? None. I prefer plywood. It occurred to Eager that in his top coat pocket was a copy of New Architecture, which featured an all-plywood house. He opened the magazine and offered it to Wary. Plywood seems to be used quite a bit now, Eager observed. The FHA man averted his eyes embarrassedly, as if he had been offered a set of art nudes. And all this glass, Wary continued severely. That's a sliding glass wall that opens the living room to the garden, said Eager proudly. That would be all right in Malibu or Bel Air, but for your neighborhood, no. His eyes pounced again. Aren't you going to paint the wood? No, Eager said flatly. I'm not. I happen to like natural finish. He reached for the plans. It was useless, he saw, to prolong the interview. In parting, the FHA man said kindly, it's not a bad house. The only trouble with it is that it's 20 years ahead of its time. Eager was rolling up the plans. He stopped and laughed wryly. That's when the mortgage would have been paid off, in 20 years. When Eager applied for a loan the next day at the Bank of the Pacific, the first thing he asked was, do you have any objection to modern design? Not unless it's grotesque, the banker said. Recalling the FHA man's boast that they loaned on anything that wasn't a freak, Eager was on his guard. He asked the banker if he considered a shed roof grotesque. It depends on location, said, said the banker. Location of what? Your lot. 
if you're on a street with a lot of Cape Cods, a flat roof would stand out like a sore thumb. But this isn't, a, this isn't, but it isn't flat. It's a low-pitched roof with a clear story on the high side of the shed. Well, to be frank, a roof like that penalizes a house. You see, Eager, our concern is future economic use. In other words, does it have continued marketability? Not that it is our wish to foreclose, but, but if it had to be done, Eager saw individualism would, in, would interfere with the quick turnover. Three months and five conferences later, construction was started on the Eager house. A compromise had been reached on the kitchen, which was now neither on the front nor the back, Gardner Street, if you prefer, but on the side. The shed, the shed room was now gabled because of what the bank called the character of the neighborhood. The roof was of shakes. The glass wall on the garden side had become a pair of French doors, and the plywood walls were now plaster. The Eagers had won out on the finish of the woodwork. Natural finish, the Bank of Pacific conceded, was not too grotesque. I'm remembering the strong reactions to your house in Santa Monica when you first redid it in 1978. You're framing a traditional bungalow with that industrial style, second structure of chain link, plywood, and corrugated metal didn't sit too well with your neighbors. Now the house is so revered, you've told me you wish you'd sold popcorn to all the architecture students, architects, and critics who've since tramped through it. Can you give me a little history on the house? Berta and I got married in 1975, and our son Alejandro was born right away, the first year we were married. We were living in Ocean Park in an apartment building I had done, where I cut a hole through the wall so we had a one-bedroom and two-bedroom joint, and we had a housekeeper live in to take care of Alejandro. But when Berta became pregnant with Sam, we knew the apartment wasn't going to work anymore. We needed a house. I told Berta I didn't have time to find a house, and because we like Santa Monica, she got a realtor there. The realtor found this pink bungalow on a corner, which at the time was the only two-story house in the neighborhood. We could have moved in as it was. The upstairs was large enough for a bedroom and a room for the baby, but it needed a new kitchen and the dining room was tiny, a little closet. The downstairs was a bit claustrophobic. I started working on its design and got excited about the idea of building a new house around the old house. Nobody realizes I had done the same thing a, few, a year before in Hollywood when the office was out of work. We figured we could both create work and make money. We had, all, we had all chipped in and bought the house, then remodeled it. We built a new house around the old house, and the new house was in the same language as the old house. I liked that idea, and I hadn't really explored it enough, so when I got this house, I decided to take that idea further. You've gotten referred to the house as your architectural laboratory. How did Berta feel about that? Berta was a great client. <laughs> As we all know, the house became legendary. One writer called it the house that built Gary. When you looked back on it now, does it seem like a career marker to you? The media called it that. It was the most freedom I'd had at that point. I could express myself more directly without editing. We didn't have much money either. I was doing a house for the businessman and art collector, Freddie Wiseman, down at the beach, and he loaned me the money for the down payment. I think we started out spending forty or 50000 and we ended up spending maybe 100000 over time. That was a lot, because we had paid 160 for it. My house couldn't be built anywhere but California, because it is single glazed, and I was experimenting with materials that are used here. It's also not an expensive construction technique. I was using it to learn the craft, to try to figure out how to use that. That was also something about the blurring of the edges between past and present that worked. People came in and asked if things like stains were intentional. We magically made a point where you weren't sure which kind of, which kind of gave it a strength. I think that's what people liked about it. In Sidney Pollock's documentary, Sketches of Frank Gehry, the architect and critic Charles Jenks recounts that you were shaving one day, didn't have enough light, and punched a hole in the ceiling. Is that true? No, I consciously went to the house. I wanted a window in the bathroom, so I took a hammer and punched a hole in the ceiling with the hammer. Then I put a piece of glass on the outside roof with heavy sealant so it would stay and so it wouldn't leak. That became the bathroom window. It was done like that. 
But it was done in the spirit of the house? Yes. Remember that on the first iteration of the house, I didn't have a lot of money to play with. It was an old house built in 1904, then moved in the 1920s from Ocean Avenue to its present site in Santa Monica. I couldn't afford to fix everything, and I was trying to use the strength of the original house so that when the house was finished, its real artistic value was that you didn't know what was intentional and what wasn't. You couldn't tell. It took all those clues away, and in my opinion, that was the strength of the house. That's what made it mysterious to people and exciting. Arthur Drexler, the longtime influential curator and director of the Department of the Architecture and Design at the Museum of Modern Art, who died in 1987, attended a dinner in my house once when I wasn't there. Then he went back to New York and he was deprecating the house. He didn't like it and he didn't like my work. He thought it was a joke. And the thing that he found the funniest was he saw a smudge on the wall and he didn't know whether it was there on purpose or not. That was his sort of put down remark. But he was looking at it exactly the way you wanted him to look at it, wasn't he? Yes, but he didn't know that he was looking at the essence of the design. Had he understood that, it would have clicked into place that he would have seen that it was something else. The house changed when you remodeled it the second time in 1991. It did. The kids needed bathrooms and stuff, and we had more money to spend. We built a pool, we fixed the roof, we fixed the skylights and the electrical system. A lot was done that unraveled that old house, and I lost it. The house now has vestigial reminders of the old strength, but it's not as good a house. It's not as good a piece of art, if you want to call it art, as it was on the first go around. That's my opinion, although I'm pretty sure that it would be shared with, by others who knew both. But I couldn't do anything about it. I had to lose it because I needed the room for the kids, and there was no way to preserve that original idea without contriving it in a second in instance, and I didn't want to do that. So I just charged ahead and took it on the chin, took one for the team. Thanks to all three, uh, all three of my students. And now um, we're going to hear short interludes on the LA house from Peter Zellner and from DJ Waldy. Peter Zellner is, um, he leads a comms Los Angeles architecture studio and was previously the principal of the design office Zellner Plus. And DJ Waldy, as many of you know, is the author of Holy Land, a suburban memoir, one of the very finest books um, about the built environment in Los Angeles, as, where as, as well as Where We Are Now, Notes from Los Angeles, and other books uh, on Southern California. So Peter will begin. Thank you, Christopher. I'm the comedy act. Um, and I hope this clicker works, yes? Forward. Okay. Um, so this is the story of a little house that could, and perhaps it's a parable about um, ways in which architecture can uh, advance Los Angeles, not through the exceptional, but rather by promoting the ordinary. Um, you may know this as a dingbat. Um, Rainer Banham famously wrote about the dingbat, and essentially the dingbat is kind of half of a parking structure and half of a dumb stucco box, but it was the, the, um, it was the module that basically built uh, multifamily housing across the Southland uh, in the 1950s and 60s. And of course, these things got decorated and transformed. But um, what I am going to show you really is uh, a single family house that attempts to update um, the concept of the dingbat for an underperforming 25 by 100 foot lot. So I'm going to ask a few questions. Um, the first is about density, which is how do you double density in an R1 neighborhood? The second is about affordability. How do you build for $175 a square foot? The third question is about speed. How do you build a house in six months? Um, the last one really has to do with demographics and the sort of shifting nature of the family in Los Angeles. Um, how do you create a house for um, a multi-generational family, uh, parents, children, and grandmother? Um, and lastly, there's, there's kind of a, a the comedic part is, has to do with style, which I suppose has to do with what the appropriate style for LA might be. So. Um, this uh, lot is in West Los Angeles, and um, it was, uh, it's an underperforming R1 lot. So it's a split lot, and um, by code, you can't build on it, essentially, because it is 2,500 square feet, not 5,000, which is the minimum lot size for R1 construction. Um, but with a lot of uh, help from the city, we managed to get this through four years of negotiation um, and no conditional use permit. Um, and the result is a 1,600 square foot house that is um, four bedrooms, uh, three and a half baths, and um, 
also accommodates parking, which is important. So upstairs you have, let's see if this works. Right here there's the master bedroom and a balcony, master bathroom, um, separate laundry. Uh, two bedrooms, interestingly, for the children who are in their 20s but are going to college and live at home. And I think this is an interesting phenomenon is that, that kids are not moving out uh, at 18. They're moving out maybe at 30. <laughs> and then downstairs um, there's a room for grandma and it's ADA compliant. And then there's a kind of living and kitchen that's kind of combined um, that opens out uh, onto, um, onto a garden in the front. And you'll sort of see the diagram. So the house has two cantilevers. There's a, there's a kind of cantilever at the front that um, opens out onto a garden. And at the back, there's a cantilever that partially uh, accounts for um, two required parking spaces. It is 16 foot 6 wide. So that's uh, but it's remarkably spacious um, when you go in it. So the other question about building for $175 a square foot has more to do with really taking advantage of existing building modules. And, and um, frankly, it's a stucco box, so it's as dumb as the dingbat. Um, this is how I envisioned it. That's how it turned out. Uh, this project was kind of sold and resold. Um, and eventually, I kind of uh, got disinvolved in it. But the question isn't so much its appearance, rather, but you know, its functionality and its ability um, to deliver, you know, again, a kind of independent lifestyle for a family, um, detached, to produce a different module. It's not a McMansion. It's, it's really, you know, something quite large for the neighborhood, but at the same time, it's very small. And I think what's really interesting is the idea that the house now actually has to serve a multi-generational family and essentially be a place not just for parents and children who eventually move out, but parents and children and grandma who stay together. This is a, for Mexican-American family who's made their living um, primarily cleaning restaurants and houses and, and basically paid cash for all of this. And we did it in toto for $275,000. Um, so the question of style is an interesting one because, of course, you know, as an architect, I you know, envisioned this thing as a kind of minimalist white box. And for those of you who know my work, most of it's been kind of white. I did the Matthew Marks Gallery over in West Hollywood. And of course, the clients who purchased the drawings from me and worked with our engineer um, you know, envisioned something different. So <laughs> um, although I think you know, the more I look at it, the, 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 really, the, the interesting question is, what is an appropriate style? And does it even matter if I, the architect, am horrified by certain aspects of its execution when, in fact, it met its, its goal, which was to get a family of four people in a single family house in West LA, uh, in their house in under six months from start of construction for, for under $300,000. So it's le it leaves me with a question about you know, what it could be, what it should be, um, but I think that it achieves some of its goals and I'm quite happy about that. So thank you. In uh, late December 1949, the developers of Lakewood began building a new kind of American place in southeast Los Angeles County. It was designed to, re to uh, resolve one of the most discussed social issues of the previous 50 years. The question was, how would working class Americans be housed? That question had been asked in a great many ways, um, including uh, in a series of pamphlets published by the War Department beginning in 1943 and distributed to fighting men and sailors and Marines in the battlefields of Europe and the Pacific. The War Department asked men in combat uh, to consider what their post-war house would look like. The image of home in those pamphlets was remarkably like the 750 square foot house, uh, houses that Bill Levitt began building on Long Island almost as soon as the war ended. Um, in this aerial photograph of Lakewood, which you saw earlier, uh, taken in early 1950 by William A. Garnett, Lakewood and Levittown seem superficially alike. But the economics and the construction, construction technology of a mass-produced tract house had moved on since 1946. 
uh, in Lakewood's case, six square miles of indifferent farmland passed from this in January 1950 to this in January 1952. In the end, 17,500 houses would be built in less than three years. Whoops. Since this is California 1950, Tract House Lakewood would, would be a place not of the past or even in the present. Lakewood would be located in tomorrow. Tomorrow would be necessarily modern, but what did that mean? Being modern seemed to mean a thousand square foot house, just a single story, no basement, usually with an attached one car garage, sometimes with a two car garage, on a 5,000 square foot lot. Although they were called ranch houses in the West and ramblers elsewhere, these houses didn't ramble much. The Federal Housing Administration called them minimal traditional houses, with the emphasis, it seems, on minimal. In deference to Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, these are not decorated sheds. These are virtually undecorated sheds. But at least it wasn't a half tent in an oil camp outside of Taft, or rented rooms in a clabbered tenement in Los Angeles, or a farm worker's shack somewhere west of Fresno. Some of those who bought a house in Lakewood in 1950 had recently lived in those places. For those who came to Lakewood, the aspiration wasn't for more, but only for enough. Lakewood didn't look modern, to the disappointment of those who imagined that in the future all roofs would be flat. But Lakewood, in its modest modernity, did have stainless steel and a garbage disposal under every seat, a sink. To be modern was aluminum screens on the windows and an O'Keefe and Merritt stove and a Bendix Economat washer. And room-sized voids into which a variety of, of historical furniture styles might be introduced early American, Danish modern, and even, even, whoops, Danish modern. <laughs> Something was missing there. Although some of us look on these commonplace things with irony today. The pace of construction did not let up so that by the end of 1952, Lakewood looked like this from the aesthetically privileged height of 2,000 feet, about eight units per acre on a grid of streets opening outward, with neighborhood retail clustered at the edges of the super blocks about every half mile, and school sites and park sites generally located within each super block. And if this sounds vaguely new urbanist to you, that's because it is. At the heart of Lakewood was a new kind of downtown, planned by Albert, Albert C. Martin and Associates, and oriented around parking for as many as 10,000 automobiles. The May Company's largest suburban store, more than 36,000 square feet, an open-air pedestrian mall, tropically landscaped, and proto-googie flourishes like this gas station that seems ready for takeoff. In 1950-1951, under the atomic cloud of the Cold War and, and with a shooting war in Korea, it did not take much to sell tomorrow. In fact, the sales pitch was curiously, almost pathetically humble. After 10 years of the Great Depression and four years of war, simply living was the chief desire. We're really going to live in Lakewood, which seemed then, I suppose, to be enough. The developers put up a lighted tower and a street of model homes to attract buyers, but they did not need to. 
prospective buyers stood in long lines waiting to sign a purchase agreement. They bought, as one salesman said, a pin on a map, and they were so young. And a few weeks later, they moved in without much regard to the reductive view of suburbia that came later, in which the mass-produced track development was rescripted in James Howard Kunstler's bleak dismissal as the place where evil dwells. It was not a perfect place. It was flawed. Still, the commodified tract house accepted displaced Okies and Arkies, Jews who knew the pain of exclusion, Catholics who thought they did, and anyone white with a steady job. Left out of this spectacle, left out of, this spectacle of democracy were people of color, whose exclusion was not only a liquid transgression. What had been cast as dystopic even before the moving vans arrived settled into being home. My parents and their neighbors in the 1950s understood what was to be found and lost in owning a small house on a small lot in a suburb connected to square miles of just the same. Despite its disappointing aesthetics, Despite everything that was ignored or squandered in Lakewood's making, I believe a kind of dignity was gained. More men than just my father told me that living there allowed them habits that did not make them feel ashamed and a life they felt was whole. And as far as I could tell by their lives together, my parents did not escape to their mass-produced suburb. They never considered escaping from it, nor have I. Thank you so much, DJ and Peter. And let me um, bring up our panelists, and I'll introduce them as they come. Um, you've heard from DJ Waldy already. And again, I really, really recommend Holy Land, a book that is really has this story at its core. Um, uh, if you haven't, if you haven't read that great book, um, uh, DJ Waldy will be joined uh, by Maria Cabildo, who was for more than 15 years president of the East Los Angeles Community Corporation, a nonprofit organization focused on housing and economic development in Boyle Heights and unincorporated East Los Angeles. She is soon to be chief of staff to County Supervisor Hilda Solis. You can come up, Maria. Um, and also appointed by Mayor Garcetti to the City Planning Commission. So um, very fluent conversant in all of those issues. Uh, Barbara Bester, who many of you will know, principal of Bester Architecture, as well as executive director of the Woodbury University's Julius Shulman Institute, Barbara. Um, and Mott Smith, co-founder of Civic Enterprise, an LA firm that builds innovative, socially conscious projects in emerging neighborhoods and provides innovative economic development solutions for cities and communities. Where's Mott? Here he comes from the back. Um, thank you. So I'll make my way over there. And I want to start, I think, Barbara, you have a couple of images. Um, does everyone have a microphone? OK, good. Um, um, I want to, do we have Barbara's images? I think we do. Um, I wanted to ask um, Barbara first, as I juggle all these things, to, you know, I think the focus um, of this part of the conversation is really how we begin to, to think about ways to tweak the single family um, fabric to um, deal with affordability, to deal with accessibility, deal with aging in place, and all the things that we've begun to talk about. So Barbara's firm is at work on a project in Echo Park called Blackbirds that I, I wanted her to talk a little bit about, made possible by the Small Lot Subdivision Ordinance, and I think one of the most interesting projects along these lines. Thank you. Well, I, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the Small Lot Ordinance, maybe together with that other um, somewhat visionary act that I think it's Jane Bluthenthal created downtown, which sort of eliminated the parking requirements right. for change of use, are examples of like a policy change that allows a lot of sort of architectural transformation to happen. Adaptive so we all know reuse the ordinance, right? Yeah, the yeah. adaptive reuse yeah. ordinance, which allows a lot of the density that we see developing rather quickly downtown. Right. So the small lot is this one that I've um, been interested in for a long time, since it's, I think it's five years now or something. Actually, Mott <laughs> did my favorite small lot, which is sort of taking a bungalow court project and turning it into a small lot, essentially 
cutting up each little bungalow court into a separate sellable lot that then people could get a conventional mortgage on, which ultimately is one of the main sort of advantages of something like the small lot is that it doesn't require, you know, uh, the, the, say, condo fee overhead and litigious atmosphere, but and it also allows an entry-level buyer to buy, you know, a smaller house on a smaller lot than, than the regular um, single-family zoning that we're familiar with, and as we see land becoming so much more expensive in L.A. So our diagram here, I think my <laughs> fellow panelists can't see it, but that, that's a... That's a uh, a study of the density of the neighborhood where Blackbirds happens, which is in Echo Park, which honestly, I think in the three or four years since we've been doing this is yet another area where the land value has, I don't know, doubled at least, if not quadrupled. Um, but interestingly, those of you who know that, you know, it's a kind of lovely, hilly, sort of Topanga-ish part of LA in the middle of, um, you know, right next to downtown and, and has a lot of the housing stock dates back to sort of the late 19th century, early 20th century, and is often on the scale of the smaller bungalow or even kind of shack. And I had done a house a long time ago for myself that was a, a remodel of a shack. And I think, in a way, the developers <laughs> on this project wanted me to try and bring that to this uh, kind of more complicated multifamily project. Um, this is a diagram of how Blackbirds works with some sort of pink highlights mm -hmm. um, to sort of talk about what the pieces are. But, but basically, the developer had bought a, a parcel that someone else had amassed of five single-family lots. And the idea was to cut those up using the small lot ordinance into 18 little lots. But in order to not have that be a giant sort of wall of townhouses, which is what a lot of you guys have probably seen has been the result often of the small lot ordinance, um, the idea was to sort of take the cues from the topography and the local massing and make these into something different. So, so some of these are two houses that look like one house. Some of them are humorously three houses that look like one and a half houses. And there are also some single family houses. Um, so the massing is different, but also we were looking at the sort of European idea of the Wunerf, which is a, using a parking area as also a landscape area that could be used in different ways during the day when hypothetically the cars would be gone. So we have um, invested a lot of the funding of or the larger scale funding of the project into this landscaped court, which has a lot of trees. Mia Lair is the landscape architect who I believe is here tonight. Um, so it's sort of, it, it's trying to make this thing where you, you drive in and your front door is where all your other neighbors' front door is. You would actually see your neighbors. The idea is to create a sense of community and as, as well as the, you know, the, the affordability of the of the um, sort of little house on its little piece of land. This is, um, this is what the complex looks like in, the, in context. It's a combination of uh, black and white buildings. The white ones are a couple of white metal, and the other ones are just a black hardy panel type of structure. Here's a close-up that shows the one and a half houses, how that works. So it's sort of one unit actually has a shed, one has a end up, but the, as, a, as a group, they sort of allow, it uh, allows them to travel down the hill. And I just finally went to Sea Ranch for the first time a week ago. I was like, oh, yeah, they kind of did that already. But there's a, that sort of idea of, of, you know, how do you get like a larger compound to, to adapt to that hillside? And this is a, a way of, it, of attempting it, I guess. No, I think some of those precedents are the greatest thing about it. I think Sea Ranch and the Ed Barnes, there seems to be a lot of haystack school in it, and even some non-residential precedents that are making their way in, and of course the kind of history of residential architecture in LA. Um, uh, thank you, Barbara. And Mont, let me ask you somebody who did. I mean, you did the first small lot project that I wrote about, certainly Maltman Bungalows, that Barbara was mentioning. Um, tell us about that experience, and do you think the ordinance has been tweaked, can be tweaked, needs to be tweaked going forward? But start with Maltman Bungalows. Tell, tell us about that project, what it looked like when you, when you first saw the property, and what happened, what happened after that. Sure. Okay. So um, we, we were lucky enough to be consulted by Jane Blumenfeld, the, the visionary planner who came up with so many great things before she retired. And... Um, you know, she asked us a lot of our opinions about how developers would respond to this. And in one of those conversations, Jane said, hey, bungalow courts are getting torn down everywhere. Why don't you use the small lot ordinance to save one? And my partner and I thought that was a great idea. We started driving around. We saw the Maltman bungalows on Maltman and Silver Lake. We drove down the long driveway and then almost got caught at the end like so many people did. 
and uh, couldn't believe it was real. Researched it. It turned out, you know, it, bo both my partner and I had a background in affordable housing. We were very interested in not displacing low-income families, and it was it, even then it was mostly uh, hipster households. Um, and uh, the, the bungalows were decrepit. They they had been they they'd been owned by the same family since the 1930s. Um, they were very cool places, you know, 700 square feet, one and two bedroom houses, um, but inefficiently laid out with very old style kitchens with, with, uh, with boiler rooms in each, in each of the units, taking up about a, you know, an eighth of the space. And we, um, we went in, we, we used the small little ordinance to subdivide it. It was a harrowing experience as every development project in the city of LA is. Um, our goal was but to- More harrowing than a typical one because you were Absolutely more harrowing th than the typical one. Tell ones, us about the ways in which it was more harrowing. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you have done a small lot project here? Okay, so some, you, some familiarity. Th I mean, the, the big problem in the city of Los Angeles is, well, one of the many big problems in the city of LA, is that building and safety, the building department is responsible for enforcing zoning code when you apply for a building permit. And the building department doesn't often agree with the planning department about the intent of the zoning code that the planning department wrote. And so we were trapped, as many people were, in this abyss where um, the small lot ordinance, which altered the zoning to make it possible to preserve this bungalow court, the building department ruled didn't come into effect until we actually recorded the final tract map two years from the time we were supposed to start construction. And uh, that simple problem that they, they didn't see how they could approve our building permits to keep existing units in place uh, until this ultimate uh, recordation happened was, was a huge problem for us and for many people. It's only recently um, that there's been a fix suggested. Now, when people do small lot projects, as you know, Barbara, you not only have to apply for a subdivision, you also have to apply for a package of variances to temporarily conform your project to the future zoning so that at the time you record the final map, those variances become irrelevant. Barbara, you're shaking your head like you're, you're <laughs> yeah. going through it's, all it's, it's very expensive for architects. I'll yeah, it's, 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 and for developers and for, and for the ultimate buyers of the houses. It, it's, it's, um, it's one of the many absurd rituals that we we do here to allay our anxiety about the future and in so doing make housing more expensive and make ourselves all more anxious. And does that mean it, to, well, because of that, given that, to what extent do you think it has a future, to, to what extent, given the realities of planning in LA, can actually work at a mass scale? Because we, we have such a long history here, the case study, I mean, probably the most famous example, meant to be a prototype for affordable housing after the war that wound up essentially being a series of one-off houses that became very famous and very expensive. Yeah, I mean, as, as, as you know, the, the small lot ordinance is now under attack. It's th there's a whole group of people trying to repeal it because of some uh, uncomfortable outcomes. And, and, and I actually understand why it's Uncomfortable how? Well, you know, um, uh, people look at the small lot ordinance. Uh, w I was at the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council a few months ago hearing, s li listening to some cases about the small lot ordinance. And the general sense among the people on the, on the council was that they are too big, too dense, too monolithic. Uh, the windows look into their yards, you know, t sort of typical concerns. Um, some of which are founded, some of which really aren't because somebody could build a multifamily structure, um, a rental project with exactly the same mass. Right, and, and again, it, it's worth clarifying that the, these projects are only possible in multifamily zone neighborhoods anyway. They're not possible in, in, in single family neighborhoods, so. Right. Well, and, and the thing, th but but because the small lot ordinance makes it affordable, more affordable for people to buy houses, and therefore more feasible as a developer for me to sell somebody a house than to rent somebody an apartment, um, you'll see more of them go up. And so this sort of secret, um, th this secret barrier to development, which is economic infeasibility, um, was trumped a little bit by this ordinance. And I think that's one of the things that's so threatening about it, is it opens the door to development where uh, people were able to relax before that nothing would have been feasible. I, I just wanted to say that I think, I think there's an interesting precedent in Santa Monica from the 80s with the townhouse project that was there. A, a, lot, of, a lot of our most famous architects in LA did projects there under that ruling, which I think got all repealed at some point. But, but I think the small lot does have that potential to do you know, interesting projects. I think there is often a, a maybe the, 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 the thing, I hear, thing I hear the most is a sort of idea of like an out-of-town developer coming and building 200 units all in a row, just sort of like a horrible you know, townhouse strip just randomly put somewhere. And that, that, you know, that seems like that might be a good thing to, 
to change how that works. But I think from a from a architectural point of view, especially if it was more affordable for someone to do it who couldn't who, who could afford to do the project without having to hold on to that much capital for like three years or whatever it is that you have to sit around waiting for your variances. Like then you could, it would, it would be a lot easier for more people to engage in more experimental work. Cause would I think that would be the goal. Would you do another small lot project? Only if I was the developer. Interesting. Uh, Maria, let me, let me ask you about the potential of this um, kind of model for affordable housing. Should we be thinking about this kind of moderate density or even even single family house construction or did, does it need to be um, a different much denser kind of model is there anything to be learned from these experiments and some of the pitfalls in terms of affordable housing sure i think that um you know we've actually been looking at and i'm still referring to elec as we because i'm still on till the april 30th but um we've been looking at it because we did see a lot of potential for this um as a tool to develop affordable housing for low-income families. Um, it's been difficult because the price of land just keeps going up and up and up, and the transaction costs that they've already talked about are very real. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's very hard to, um, you know, an entry-level buyer is, is really substantially higher income than uh, the families that we work with. So that, that's a huge, huge challenge. For me, um, I've been a real um, advocate for this idea of value capture. Um, and I'm, I haven't read the mayor's uh, sustainability plan, but I understand the value capture is addressed there. So I actually feel that every time that the city or the county creates an entitlement like the small lot ordinance or increases in density, that we should be asking for a public benefit. And just the creation of additional housing isn't enough of a public benefit, mm -hmm. that it needs to do something to preserve the economic diversity of this city. And my concern with the small lot ordinance so far is that I feel that the price point is really very high and is not reaching working class families here in LA. I'm really glad that you added this piece around the racial discrimination that took place during the development of these planned communities in the post-war era because they were not diverse places. There was redlining. African-American families, Latino families, soldiers who fought in World War II came back and faced great discrimination and could not benefit from this, this post-war boom in housing. So I feel that every time that government, like FHA providing mortgage, fi you know, insurance, providing an entitlement like the small ordinance or an increase in density, there needs to be a public benefit. And so specifically as- I think unless we- legislate that, it's not gonna happen. Because the reality is, I've been a developer, I know, I've seen the numbers. It's, it's difficult to, um, uh, rec you know, just, it's, I, you know, I know these folks are amazing, right? And if they could, they would lower their price point, but they really can't. And I feel that if we put it right in the code, then the sales price of land will reflect the fact that that's a requirement and the, la the land prices will not be as escalated as they are. And specifically at the county level where you'll be working and also <coughs> thinking about the city, what are, the s what are the specific policy changes that you think could, could have the most impact? Is it thinking about parking requirements? Is it thinking about um, some of those fundamental changes? What can begin to you know, chip away at these, these issues that you're describing in terms of prices particularly? Oh, well, I think that, um, you know, and I want to recognize my fellow commissioner, the vice president of the Planning Commission, Renee Dake Wilson, who was nice enough to send me text messages to remind me of what I should say. <laughs> <laughs> but I think some of those pieces are really looking at how we hardwire some of these equity pieces in the code. I think the CAS plan, um, the Corpula Royal Seco specific plan, does some of that. Um, and I think in terms of, gosh, I, I um, wish I could get Renee. You can look there. at the phone if you want. <laughs> oh, I, I left it in my purse. I left both my phones in, in my purse. But um, I think definitely uh, around the fixes, around um, in cr looking at density. I mean, it was really amazing. We approved a project at the last planning commission, and it was out in the valley. And they were talking about the urbanization and how urban it was. And there were 6,000 square foot lots. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God, that's not, 
So, so I think it's also the fact that we're so, I'm, I'm, a, I'm from East LA, so I have a very different view of the city, but this city is huge. And we're, we, you know, we have planning commission meetings where you know, horse country comes and protests development. So I think it's really looking at how do we um, get other parts of the city to embrace some of this density and uh, allow more of this development and have an equity piece, which means you actually change the code to require that. It's politically been such a difficult issue. It really, the changes to the single family neighborhood are, are really the third rail of LA politics. Still, even for a mayor like Garcetti, who's willing to talk about a lot of these issues, um, it's still difficult to get even the mayor to talk about uh, changes in density. Do you see any change in that, just in terms of the political conversation, what's on the table, what we're talking about? It's interesting. I mean, this this community that came out um, at the last planning commission hearing, um, they and they were talking about this being very urban. And of course, you know, I saw like three times the number of units in my head for what that was actually proposed. But they actually accepted it. And I think part of it was the developer really being very, very thoughtful in the way that he com he communicated with the community. But I think that you know it's. It's, it's not popular, but we need to have this discussion because the reality is that whether we do anything or not, we're gonna grow by a third, right, by 2050. Whether we do anything or not, we probably have the best climate in the region. And as far as the city of LA, I mean, what, by the year 2050, we're gonna have a third, three times the number of days over 100 degrees, right? So people are gonna be like trying to get out of the hottest places and we have this really wonderful climate here. So people are gonna come whether we plan for them or not. So I think that, uh, I know it's a third rail, but I think we need to have some leadership there and people actually embrace that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I'm do saying that now, uh, right. not, not, uh, <laughs> not as a well, representative of my future boss. We will, talk you, we will talk to you again in a few months um, and, and see <laughs> how all of that is going. DJ Waldy, what, what is the future for a, a community like Lakewood now, given all of this and given the changes demographically and so forth that are going on? Does it continue to look the way that it's looked? Are there ways to tweak it while maintaining some of the appeal that you, I think, have so eloquently described? Well, certainly there there are. Um, I can recollect a, a series of conversations I had in uh, almost ten years ago uh, with architects and architectural students um, at the um, in Northern California, talking about the transformation of the five thousand square foot lot by the addition of uh, ex some accessory stru structure, a, a second unit on the lot, and there were some rather creative approaches to that even then. The difficulty, of course, is um, finding a way to that goal through the reluctance of the 88 city councils that are a part of the political structure of Los Angeles County. We've been talking this evening as if all there was was the city of LA, uh, and it's not. Um, there are millions more of us who don't live in the city of Los Angeles who um, need to deal with these issues as well, and an awful lot of Southern California looks like looks an awful lot like Lakewood. So, what will Lakewood look like in, in 25? It's not going to look a whole years. lot different. I, there's, there aren't bulldozers at the end of my block waiting right. to bulldoze right. my house down. Um, it's not going to be transformed into uh, something entirely different, but it must be denser in some way. And the question is how to fit that density within the um, the kind of space that people find um, capable of calling home. Um, one of the things that has struck me about this evening's conversation, even going back to talking about the Schindler House, is the expectation that you wouldn't live there very long, that you would move on to some other place, that the Schindler House was in fact built for young families because eventually they would be older families and presumably they would want other living accommodations. But a place like Lakewood has accommodated everyone from young married husbands and wives in 1951 who were in, in their early 20s to um, the frail elderly today. It's accommodated me, I'm, I'm in my mid-60s. Can we make a place in which people can invest certain loyalties and persist in those places? Or are we intending to build neighborhoods where the presumption is no one will stay there very long. I think that's a perfect segue to the to the accessory dwelling unit, the granny flat conversation, because I, I think one of the, 
the real potential of making that work in LA and the surrounding cities, and you're right to remind us that um, it, we're not just talking about the city of LA, especially sitting here in West Hollywood. <laughs> um, the, the potential is to build some flexibility into the what has traditionally been a single family neighborhood so that um, a couple could move from a rental unit to the house on the property and rent it out, rent out the rental unit to make um, uh, some income to help pay the mortgage or have in-laws, extended family, live with them and move from a smaller um, unit to a, to a house on the same piece of land and, and have a kind of continuity, exactly the kind of continuity that you're, that you're talking about. I had some experience with this personally when, when my wife and I owned a very small house in Eagle Rock and the adjacent vacant parcel and, and it was very easy to imagine, particularly because the house was on a pedestrian path, one of those paths that was built in the 20s to get down to the red car line on Colorado Boulevard, um, that even some moderate density in what was an R on R1 parcel, a kind of a granny flat, um, could have accommodated all the things you're talking about, the connection to the landscape, and um, and, but even that was, was impossible and maybe is beginning to be um, talked about in a different way. So let me ask the, the rest of you, what, what is the potential for doing that? I should say also just to clarify for those of you who aren't familiar that the granny flats are, are um, made legal by a state law which was passed in the 80s and then sort of reinforced um, more recently, but each individual city mu municipality is able to um, tweak that regulation and essentially make it impossible um, as, as certain cities have done. Los Angeles hasn't made it quite impossible, but you can probably count on a couple of hands how many um, accessory dwelling units have actually been approved. Um, so, Maud Smith, what's the potential for that to be tweaked and uh, to become perhaps, I mean, tell me if you think this is true, a kind of a way without really disrupting the kind of single family fabric, a way for some more flexibility for the kind of continuity, maybe even to, to protect against displacement in communities that are going through significant change? Yeah, I, I, I think there's going to be very little action in the upper income areas as far as that goes. Uh, I think the opposition is just going to be too strong. I think the real action is going to be in the lower income areas like, uh, frankly, the southeast, the, 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 the gateway cities um, where people are already occupying homes as though they have granny flats even if they don't. Um, I think there's much more action um, policy-wise in terms of legitimizing the current shadow housing community um, uh, th than there is in actually building new stuff. Um, I think where we're going to see density take effect is, is legalizing micro units. I think a different form of value capture, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of the idea of, of increasing equity, but I don't think we're going to do it by taxing development. I think we need to do it by taxing everybody. Um, and I think by making it more feasible, easier to build denser, smaller, uh, unit bigger projects will take a big bite and by legitimizing the currently Ill illegal uh, informal housing that's going on right now will we'll take a big bite as well. I think there, uh, well, I think Port Portland is a good example, right, of a city that has that kind of an ordinance that's worked out and I guess one thing about Portland is that it, it is more uh, as a city more of a kind of just middle class sort of city. It doesn't have a super fancy part as much and it doesn't have as much low income part. It's got that core. So so maybe it applies to places like Mar Vista and stuff like that here that are kind of, you know, that the, the has me. But I, I wonder what the new uh, shared economy would have to do with this too because I, uh, on the way over here I was listening to Warren only in the, they were doing an Airbnb kind of call in show. And, um, you know, there's a huge amount of, uh, of, of, of issue there of whether you build that kind of thing just to use it as another form of capital kind of and, 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 and income so essentially it becomes commercial real estate and that is the tricky part like how do you actually build housing and not like a sort of mini hotel suites everywhere. And it becomes speculative again to go back to what Kimberly was saying that that old idea of, of uh, residential property here for, as speculation first and uh, as a place to live second maybe. Maria Cabildo, is there a, a concern about um, that shared economy, Airbnb, in terms of affordability driving up rents in neighborhoods that are already seeing um, significant affordability issues? Is that something that m policy can tackle? Oh, you know what, it's, I have to be really honest, this is an issue I've been tracking. It's like the, the, the people I've been working with you know, don't have a problem with Airbnb because they're not coming to East LA yeah, yet. Yeah. But I, ex I expect it to be happen very soon. But I did want to um, say that, you know, we have been looking, uh, Trust South LA, um, actually, I think they were, the year that we got one of those LA 2050 grants for, uh, to support the legalization of street vending, they also received an LA 2050 grant to look at 
um, the Granny Flat specifically in, in, in South LA to look at that as a way of creating affordable housing. I think the challenges they came up against were the challenges you mentioned around how difficult it is to do that in the code, parking requirements, and then also financing, like for families that are living in these low-income neighborhoods, the financing of the development of a Granny Flat is also um, prohibitive. And Barbara, I think one of the byproducts of, of this change, the fact that the city's not building single family houses any longer, um, and that it's so become so difficult to build granny flats, is that it's tough for architects. I mean, the, the, the house had been the place where architects found adventurous clients. It had been a place where experimentation, innovation happening. And so many of the, the kind of five story stick build apartment buildings that we see on every boulevard often barely using architects at all, kind of um, uh, developers building as many of those as, as they can a along the corridors where density is allowed in the city. Um, what are the avenues for kind of recapturing that spirit of, you know, my impression as a critic is that it's a very difficult place to be an architect, despite the reputation that LA has outside, it's not a place that you can come as a young architect and really expect to, to build in the way it always was. To go back to Frank's an extreme house. remodeler, I think is what you have. No, but I, I, I think that there are people, though, I mean, say like Lorcan's Project Next Door to Us or Patrick Ty, or like there's a lot of people doing kind of interesting projects in the multifamily mm -hmm. realm. A lot of them and so here in West Hollywood, too. Yeah, yeah. West Hollywood's yeah. been really sort of conducive to that, and also maybe the property values help because, you know, you can spend enough money on it. That's sometimes the challenge, you know, for how much things cost to build. Um, what I think one thing for artists is you really have to diversify. So there's a lot, like for us, we do a lot of commercial work too, you know, commercial interiors and that, that it, you can't, um, you can't kind of hold out for the empty lot type of stuff. It, it, and if anything, there, something like Venice probably has more action than a lot of places where because the lot, the land has become so insanely valuable that most things, like, Back in the day, that would have been like north of Montana and Santa Monica, but now basically anywhere in Venice on a walk street is you know, instantly worth several million dollars if you build a new house there. So people just knock down the old bungalow. So that's another challenge. Like, how, do you really want to knock down old neighborhoods and in order to create experimental architecture? It's a very uh, tricky moral slash formal zone for us all. Right, and that's really how denser cities have always worked. New York, London, the way you make it as a younger architect as you do interior projects and and, and that seems to be the case in Los Angeles more and more, despite this kind of reputation as a place where you can, you know, the, the kind of architectural frontier, it's really not that kind of a place any longer. We're, we're Increasingly subterranean projects, too, actually. <laughs> and, and um, Ma, you've worked on, I mean, there's always, th so many of the conversations have come back to parking always yeah. and parking policy, and you, it's something you've worked quite a bit on and thought a lot about where are we now in terms of changing that mindset if we oh, what kind yeah. of progress if any well the, i mean the, the millennials made? i mean I, I just moved to an apartment downtown with no parking I, I biked here tonight i couldn't be happier um uh millennials uh, famously don't need parking spaces and the, it, we've just gotten so crazy your parking like so many things is yet another break on development um, it's a break on development that I, I come to believe is there literally to prevent us from moving too quickly. Um, and when people actually hit the economic values where it makes sense to fulfill parking requirements, we end up with just awful urban design. And, and you know, looking at global warming, looking at how the world is changing, I just can't believe we're still having this conversation. Um, but now the, the greatest concern about parking, uh, limiting parking is actually coming from the, the left. Um, which is concerned, I think, that if we make it too easy to build by limiting the parking requirements, that land values will go up too fast. And I've just seen no evidence of that. Um, but it's, it's really a very dominant part of the conversation right now. And so I think, you know, it, it, it used to be the, the, the old white homeowners saying, keep the parking, and now it's actually the progressive left saying, keep the parking. And, and Barbara, t um, it sounds like the, the real central challenge of, the, of Blackbirds was really thinking about where to put the parking, where to, where to put the cars. Are, are, there, are there ways that you think are feasible to tweak that ordinance that will make it maybe politically um, possible to move to a new model that requires less parking for this kind of a project? I think, there's, I think there's two issues. One of them is just the mass of parking, enclosed parking, is these giant boxes. And, and so our thing was tweaking the ordinance already we were able to slide through with it where we didn't enclose the parking, we made the parking on the surface and part of a landscape, so it's not really physically there as 
yet more um, volume. It's also economically you know, beneficial to whoever's building it. Um, but I, I think that there's a huge generational issue, which I, I would say I was sort of on the cusp, like as a Gen X person, when I came to LA, it would have been un unmanageable to not have a car. But increasingly, everyone I meet from any generation after mine, say most people who work in my office, they don't, a lot of people don't have cars. And that is, that is huge. And that, I don't think anyone older than me knows that, you know, either. Like my, my clients are like, that's impossible. Like, of course everyone has cars. Like, actually, they really don't have cars. I mean, Mott, you're like a, Special case of a you know old, of an old person of a, of, a, of a time traveler no no you know no no you're the same age but like you know like that that you're, you're like you've embraced this more than most of us would be comfortable with but but that is a huge difference in, you know it's a great boon for our public transportation system and it's a great I think it's a great boon for how you know what might happen urbanistically as we densify I mean I'm I'm you know Silver Lake lady I like I'm really interested in what happens on Sunset Boulevard and the area around it it's been zoned much much denser than it currently is built. And, and my big concern is like, well, what does that look like? How strong is the mixed use? It seems it seems sustainable from a car point of view because it's, there may well be less cars. But that that's that's the goal. Sorry, I just have to defend the Please. left here on parking. <laughs> and I just want to say, just to be clear, that part of the reason why you get that is that right now one of the few way the few things that's available to affordable housing developers is a reduction in parking to incentivize affordable housing development. So I think the reason why there's that fear is that you make that available to everybody, then no one's gonna ever build affordable housing, no one's gonna use the density bonus. Um, so that's why we're... So we, could we trade concern. parking though for other incentives? Couldn't we build something else in that could take the place of parking and still be in a kind of incentive? Like I money for affordable housing, how about? Yeah. yeah, or you know, I think that that's something that we should be looking at, but right now that's not a direction that the planning department's getting. But what about Barbara's point about this, this um, generational shift, and at what point does policy begin to reflect that? I guess this is a question for all of you. I mean, is it just because the, the, the homeowning demographic continues to, to control a, a, a significant block of political power? What, at what point does that shift? I mean, I think we're all seeing evidence of this, of this shift happening, even the revitalization, not just of downtown, Koreatown, neighborhoods that I've been writing about, a huge group of, um, of people arriving in Los Angeles and seeking out neighborhoods where they can live without a car. And that's, that's a significant shift. And I guess the question is, at what point does policy beside, you know, beyond the adaptive reuse ordinance, which made the renaissance of downtown possible, at what point does policy really begin to reflect well, that? I think it's just really interesting, because right now, uh, we haven't seen it yet, but with the arts district, I mean, now there's, we have NIMBYs in the arts district. You know, that's not something that, you know, that wasn't there before. So it's really interesting that once a group gets in there, feels entitled, which is like very characteristic of a person who owns a single family residence, then you start getting this really restrictive uh, view of, of development. So I think that I used to think, oh, you know, it'll shift when, um, you know, you have different folks living there, but you have, you know, in the arts district, people you think that would be embracing the density now really wanting to put put a, a limit on it. And DJ Waldy, we should mention, you get around Southern California without a car, and you're <laughs> not a millennial. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, I am. I used to be um, one of the rarest of Southern Californians, a non-driver. Um, that's because of miserable eyesight, not, not um, a moral nobility. Um, <laughs> If, if I could, I would drive, but I can't. Um, but I have um, lived a, a sort of not quite middle class life um, as a transit, transit dependent and Heleno uh, and uh, on the southeast corner of the county, and it ain't easy. It's very difficult. I understand how uh, in certain portions of Los Angeles it is becoming much easier to frame a life without a car but if you pass beyond the boundaries of those um, favored neighborhoods, you will find it, uh, you have probably already found it, quite difficult to assemble um, the kind of uh, freedom of motion that we expect to find in, in our lives in, in Los Angeles. And I think one of the themes of almost all the conversations in this series have, uh, um, has been that we're in a kind of extended period of limbo as we, as we build a mature transit uh, system that we're, and we're, we're, we're at least 10 or 15, maybe 20 years away from that. And meanwhile, the freeways become tougher and tougher and, and that's just gonna be a political rat reality uh, probably for a whole 
um, generation. But Matt, you want to talk a little bit about parking well, yeah, here I in mean, West I, Hollywood? I, I want to say two things. One is about, uh, I think the biggest change that we could make to single family neighborhoods to make them more livable and more and friendlier to density would actually be to allow non-residential uses in the corner store, those sorts of things, where we'd make it easier to to get a you know a, a gallon of milk without having to get in a car or on a bus or on a bike. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is, even though we're sort of outside the realm of, of uh, single-family homes in, 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 in this, West Hollywood is one of the places in Southern California, like Pasadena, that has recently changed its parking regulation system for non-residential development. So they now have parking credits as the standard way of evaluating projects citywide. So no longer does a developer have to go lease parking from a car wash down the street in order to open up a bar. Um, the city keeps track of parking, and also the city doesn't expect the entitlements process is a huge policy shift. In, in LA, we, we still hope that we can entitle parking problems out of existence, and here they recognize that we need to, um, that, that, that you manage parking to manage parking, and so they use pricing, they use other things to keep uh, demand reasonable, and then they evaluate projects based just on their, on their applications, and so it's turned what was a one-year or two-year variance process to an over-the-counter process for new restaurants and bars, and in fact, I, I, it, was, it was like one of the highlights of my career when I saw they had approved a new place called Pump on Santa Monica Boulevard, which demolished an old building with parking and, and built a mid-block new construction restaurant with no on-site parking. And to what extent is is City of Los Angeles, which can be so slow moving, um, looking at those projects and able to adapt the smarter of them from the smaller cities, the more nimble cities around mm. that well, surround I, it? I, I, well, there are parking credits in two neighborhoods in Los Angeles, Eagle Rock and Atwater, but they're very sort of small programs and poorly administered. Hollywood, CD13 is considering parking credits for for Central Hollywood as an alternative to the web of valets and, and, and uh, off-site off parking agreements and all this madness that makes people crazy. Um, so it is being looked at seriously in CD13. Mm -hmm. And I think at, at, at bottom this is really a conversation about what um, is accessible to a wide swath of the city. I mean, the, 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 what's different about Los Angeles, these are debates that happen in cities all over the country, of course. What's different about Los Angeles is there had been an assumption for so long um, in terms of where we live and how we get around that the, the private car and the single family house were something that should be affordable to everyone. And that's really not the case in any city of, of a size, of even approaching Los Angeles' size. So I think the conversation needs to shift away from that, but there still is this sense, I mean, you said entitlement, that's, that's really the, the word, um, not just for new um, homeowners, but those who aspire to it, you know, a sense that um, that's within their right as a, as a kind of uh, citizen of Los Angeles, that that should be affordable to them, both to get everywhere easily by car and to live in a single family house with a, with a garden. Um, do you think that will continue to be the political assumption when you, you know, when you talk to policymakers, but also to voters and, 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 and residents um, in, in Boyle Heights, say, is that kind of still the aspiration in terms of how people make a life here? I think that um, it is very much so. I think that's still what people are, are looking for. Um, and you told me in one of our conversations that there's just not much appetite, as you put it, for denser, denser no. forms of living. Is that right? No, not really. I think. Uh, that's something that you know I've been able to see across the city again. That whole idea that something on a six thousand square foot lot is somehow density. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of appetite for it, but I do feel that it's this um, this aspiration, and it's still something that you know I've chosen to pursue. I mean, we at East LA Community Corporation have been you know building a lot of multifamily development, but we've still always tried to maintain some development of single family because it's been really the only vehicle available to people of color to build wealth. And I think that's, uh, for, for that reason, I think that's why it's still something that in our community is still very important to aspire to and something that we should you know, keep uh, pursuing. I think policy-wise, it's just so difficult in the city of LA because you really have, you know, we have the weak mayor system that we always talk about. And I think um, I see fixes that we could do citywide but I could see that a council person would never, ever want to give up their discretion. And so right now we have a system that really uh, uh, favors each council person having discretion. And I think while, I think probably like in CD13, CD1, and CD14, we probably would have a potential 
a really like embracing a very different view of density and um, and development pattern. But in the other 12 council districts, very difficult. So I think that's one of the challenges in LA is that you need so many votes to change any policy. So how do we begin to dislodge that? I mean, I agree that's something, I didn't really think I understood the politics of Los Angeles and planning until I realized that the amount of power that's located within each council member's office, the kind of horse trading that goes on and, and, and how defending that status quo is really important in, in terms of preserving that power. How do, do you see any signs, this is to all of you, and Maude, I know you've thought about this issue a lot, any signs that that could be dislodged and, and, and planning power can be put in the planning department where people sort of assume that it resides and it, and it really hasn't? Yeah, I, I actually, um, believe it or not, uh, while I agree with the analysis, I have, a, I have a somewhat less cynical conclusion to this, if you could imagine, which is that I, I actually think that the problem with Los Angeles um, I think there definitely are council offices that savor that discretion. I, I think it really depends on the leadership in that particular council office. I think there's some who would rather focus on real issues than somebody's fence height. Um, I think what we're dealing with is the, the, the consequence of having a, a, a planning system that was built by Herbert Hoover in 1927 when he promulgated the Standard City Planning Enabling Ordinance when he was Secretary of Commerce, which was built for new growth communities all of our policies, all of them, are designed for new growth. They're designed for Lakewoods, basically. And the process with this, with, with this fractured approval system with one group of engineers looking at this and one group of engineers looking at that is great if everybody knows how to build the same cul-de-sacs and the same 5,000 square foot postage stamp plots. It's terrible for an iterating city, which is what we have. And so I don't really... I mean, I think what it, what it boils down to ultimately is this power dynamic that we see, but I don't think the power dynamic is the cause of it. Um, I think the cause of it is we have a planning system built for suburbia and we do not have the tools to deal with true iterative urban growth. I'm sorry, so what do you think of the recode effort? Do you think that will lead to any Will that make it any better? So, so I, I think recode's great because- Tell us a little bit about recode and where we are in that process, either of you. <laughs> so I guess we're, we're basically looking at uh, rewriting the zone code for, for the very first time. So right now the zone code, there's a zone code and there's a shadow code that exists out there. And it's really about eliminating the shadow code and creating something that's much more user friendly, potentially web access. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know how the development community is looking at I, it. I think it's, I think it's uh, a, a great thing to do. I mean, I think what you're, with the shadow code you're referring to is, I mean, we have a thousand page zoning code that, that there are like three people in the city who, who know about. And, and, and as, a, as a secular Jew, I think of it in terms of the, the Jewish uh, um, a liturgy. Um, which, which basically you've got the Torah, which is the written law, and then you've got the Mishnah, which is sort of the rabbi's commentary on the written law, and then you've got all these things, which are the rabbi's commentary on the commentary, and only when you, when you reach the highest level do you really know what's going on. And it's the same thing with our, with, with, with our, with our zoning code, that only like three zoning administrators have memorized all the code, all of the memos, all of the interpretations, and the exception section at the end, which undoes most of what's in the first part. Um, and, and so I, the nice thing about Recode is it's going to make our crazy Byzantine articulation of this suburban set of standards much more transparent and much more open for discussion and debate. I think right now you can't even discuss it. And you're can optimistic that it'll actually do that? Can I think it'll make it more transparent, but I don't think it fixes the fundamental problem, which is, which is we've got a suburban development approval can, system. Can, oh. can I invite you all to come to suburban Los Angeles County, where the vote, zoning codes are very simple, every, and all the people behind the planning code, counter know what they, how to read them and how to, how to apply them. The, 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 the horror stories I'm hearing, he, hearing here are, are kind of laughable. That's not the world in which most of the cities of LA County operate. You are constrained by the by a hundred years of, um, I would say, troubled government in the city of Los Angeles. That's, but that's not the norm. Uh, architects of Los Angeles, <laughs> you're willing to lose but your chains, come to suburbia. <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to say that I think that, that on, on the positive side too, and, and maybe it, it speaks to something that Kimberly was talking about, that, that just from having done my you know, brief foray into the small lot, I think that the idea of 
If there's a way that as this changes, that there would be more potential for small collective projects and 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 a financing tool is really mainly the thing of you know post two thousand eight financing tool. As I as think you get a lot of people do wanting to do that, and I think it's really like right now it seems absolutely impossible because who would you know to be super rich basically. Right. But but that that would I, I, from architect's point of view, from a selfish point of view, you get to a lot more experiments of living. I think that that kind of experiment would be extremely suitable for both the uh, senior citizen group, which is, I mean, I'm very interested in, like, how do we house Gen X when there's billions of us, you know, later? But also um, but also the millennials who are often now buying micro-apartments that are 300 square feet, you know? So there's a kind of all this, these different ways of living that are, you know, maybe they're transient, but they are also, I think, you know, might might provide different hybrids that are less suburban, you know? If not, the, not to knock that deep, but... but <laughs> And so um, final question to all of you, that zoning map of Los Angeles or even of Lakewood, let's talk about Lakewood and the other cities, what does it look like 30, 40 years from now? Is it still mostly yellow? Is there progress in really beginning to have this difficult conversation about what at least a moderate density looks like in those neighborhoods? I mean, the politics of um, the 87 cities that are not Los Angeles in Los Angeles County w would seem to, to militate against um, dramatic change in, in the overall look of those suburban neighborhoods. More dense, certainly, uh, partly driven by, by state regulation, um, perhaps partly driven by movement at the state level toward taking further control o over land use decision making in, in communities. Um, but it, it's not going to look from the street um, significantly different. And will you stay there? Do you think you'll stay in that house? Well, I'm 67. I'm not sure how long. <laughs> 30 years. <laughs> I'll be 30 years from now. Let's uh, say 10 or 20. Well, Do you yes, think you'll I, stay there? I, I have no plans to move at this point. Um, I, I, I would suggest that part of what will change about places like Lakewood and, uh, and others, I, I, I saw an inkling of discussed by the South Bay Council of Governments a, a few months ago in which um, the effort is to bring more entrepreneurial activity to suburban neighborhoods and to make it less likely that someone would leave the neighborhood uh, to go to a job in some other location, a, a job downtown or in some other downtown. We have so many of downtowns here. So, the, so the, the, the focus there is on a different kind of density, not on more structures, but on more people staying in the neighborhood all day long. I think it, it, that really, that's really the crucial issue, that kind of flexibility and what has become such a rigid set of, yeah. uh, even, even in a place like Lakewood, even a place that's, sim that's simpler um, in, in terms of that code. So on that note, um, first of all, thank, thank you to everyone who came out tonight. Um, thanks to Kimberly Meyer and uh, Max Center for being our hosts. And please join me in thanking all of our panelists, these and the ones we heard from earlier. Thank you so much.